Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, for those of you who haven't ever met me, my name is Gareth. I'm one of the directors at First Intuition. Good to see you. Uh, look me up on LinkedIn. Always happy to answer questions, engage with people. I post, as some people will tell you, all manner of nonsense on LinkedIn around the profession, around careers, around apprenticeships particularly. Blimey, do I go on about apprenticeships? Wow. Um, so feel free to find me on LinkedIn and follow me. Uh, and always happy to answer questions, but lots of familiar faces. Um, morning, Kim. Good to see you. Morning, Lara. Thank you, everybody. And like I said, do feel free to say hello through the chat box. See a few people saying hello. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Sylvia. Good to see everyone. Thanks, Nathan. Right. Well, we'll make a bit of a gradual start. I mean, this is a, I think, a pretty hot topic and we've got lots to get through. Although to kick off, actually, I'm going to throw up a very quick poll just to get a bit of engagement, get you all earning your information this morning. So if I can launch a little poll, just put it up there for a minute or two. Just interested in what people are finding as their main staffing issues. You know, you cannot move at the moment for stories about skill shortages, staffing issues, you know, whether it's HGV drivers, apparently we're 100,000 short in the UK at the moment, HGV drivers. Um, apparently that's going to cause problems. Apparently there's going to be problems with turkeys at Christmas. Get your orders in for turkeys, apparently, because there's issues with the supply chain for turkeys. Um, hospitality, as they bounce back from significant closures in the pandemic, uh, struggling to bounce back and um, get enough staff. And in my sector, you know, in the sort of professional services sector, particularly in accountancy and finance, um, I hear stories constantly about the challenges of staffing. So I'm just quite interested in that poll around where people are seeing the significant problems. Um, I've actually been I've been involved in training accountants and I would hesitate hesitate there just to say this um, session is not just about finance and accountancy that is my background but this is an issue I think that is kind of cross sector so don't fear that this is just going to be about accountancy at all for those you know we've got some lawyers for instance on the call I know we've got some operations uh, experts on the call uh, but I've been involved in training accountants for about 25 years now now, I've seen huge amounts of change, you know, both in the wider economy in that sort of time, you know, the impact of automation, the impact of artificial intelligence, machine learning, the way that's affecting the role of people, the skills that people require. Um, there's been a massive increase in the focus on things like ethics, sustainability, diversity across businesses. Uh, we hear more and more about VUCA. Anyone come across the concept of VUCA, the oh. mnemonic for volatile uncertain, complex and ambiguous, which I think we'd all agree our businesses and our sectors and our economies are more prone to. In our sector and accountancy, particularly in the training side, we've seen a huge growth in the use of computer-based exams, on-demand exams. You know, I've seen a lot of my employers move more and more towards school leaver programs, uh, perhaps in, sometimes in favor of graduate programs. We've seen a monstrous increase in the use of apprenticeships in our sector, you know, literally transformational. We've gone from something like 5% of our learners being apprentices five years ago to probably 85% now. You know, so there's been huge amounts of change, you know, even just in the last three or four years. Some things though have stayed the same. You know, my taste in shirts over the last couple of decades has stayed the same. Um, that's never going to fall off. Um, but particularly the challenges I hear from employers around, particularly around the retention and attraction of qualified staff, very much the topic of this webinar. And in fact, I've now had good 70 answers to the poll. So if I end the poll and share it, everybody see the poll there? And actually exactly what I was expecting, exactly the reason why I put this webinar on, what I'm hearing is actually attracting entry level candidates, even from school, college, university, is actually not that hard. And in fact, I'm hearing stories that there are more, you know, more entry level candidates applying for jobs than ever before and higher caliber as well. But the big issue is around, and this poll very much shows that, 
retaining newly qualified or experienced staff, you know, perhaps four, five, six years into their careers. And I guess linked to that, because if you can't retain them, you maybe then try and recruit newbies. And so the issues of attracting those newly qualified um, staff in. So actually that poll very much showing what I was expecting to see and the reason why I thought this webinar would be very useful. So thanks for completing that. We will be sharing the recording for this session plus some tidbits that are, are brought up during it and we will include those statistics. I think they're quite interesting and very much the reason why I thought this webinar would be useful. In fact, we've been running these sorts of employer webinars for well, we're in September 21, and we started these back in March 20 at the beginning of the original lockdown, the original pandemic. So 18 months we've been going with this, um, and a few on the call, actually, I think have been pretty much with us that entire time. So thank you for your uh, patience with me and your loyalty to uh, the topics that we cover. We do try and pick out relevant hot topics that I get the impression are important across the businesses we work with. Uh, we've got a number of speakers, so I'm going to shut up very quickly now uh, and start handing over to some of our uh, contributors today. I've got a really great lineup of different speakers who can hopefully give us a wide variety of different perspectives. But I would absolutely ask everyone on the call, you will all have your own experiences of this topic, I'm sure. That's probably why you're here. You'll all have your own tips, your own experiences. Please, please, please use the chat box Obviously, we're not going to have time. We've got now nearly 100 people live on the call. We're not going to have time to hear from everyone verbally, but please use the chat box. If anything crops up during the next sort of hour and a bit um, that really resonates with you, please comment in the chat box. If you've got your own tips, anything practical that you've been using to improve either the retention of those staff you've spent so long training up to being qualified or then attracting new people at that sort of level, Please, 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 we will be gathering the content of the chat box to circulate as well. So that's always very useful. Um, but I'd like to turn, and in fact, given that we've been going for 18 months, I'm actually going to turn to one of our most regular contributors, actually, if she doesn't mind, uh, somebody who's been with us pretty much throughout this last entire 18 months um, from the ICAW, just to get, because I know the various accountancy awarding bodies, they will be you know, helping their members and helping themselves. I mean, they will be experiencing these issues just as much as the rest of us. Um, but if she doesn't mind, I wouldn't uh, mind starting off with Fiona from the ICAW, actually, if I can hand over to you for your thoughts to kick us off. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I've only got a few minutes, haven't I? So I'm going to not go into any detail, um, but completely resonate what came through on the survey, hearing it from many of our clients. Um, and I don't have a, a magic wand, I'm afraid. I, I can't give you one tip that will solve all your issues because I think it's a combination of many things. Um, we're, we've all been in the same position looking for new jobs. And what makes us stay somewhere is feeling happy in your job, feeling um, well, just respected um, and feeling like you've got somewhere to go. So it's, it's really important that individuals feel that they fit in an organization. And what I think is a real shame when I hear from employers who say they're losing some of their best and, and they haven't really done much to try and keep them. Um, it would be really lovely to say, oh, throw another 5,000 pounds in their salary package and they'll stay. We all know from our own experience, that's not gonna do it. Money is a driver for some people, particularly very early on in their careers when they're looking to progress and they, they think money means, respectability and progression but for most of us as we go through our career it's about feeling that we we have worth there and we as I say being developed and that's certainly where ICAW can help with with academy programs etc but it's good communication with people um, so they know that they're respected what their role is where they're likely to go in the future so that not only helps retain people um, but also when you're interviewing new people if you can get the ethos of your organization across in a really clear way and help them understanding how important they would be in the organization how you would look to continuously development I think that would help you attract people as well um, so 
yeah, lot, lots of muddled thoughts there, really, but mainly because I do think it is a real combination. Um, you know, I've seen people talk about, oh, should we give more incentives? Should we give um, increased maternity and paternity leave? Should we give, um, you know, like money to buy a bicycle to cycle to work? Well, they're all absolutely lovely. And yes, please consider doing those things as well. But I don't think those little things are going to help you retain staff or attract staff. Obviously, it says a lot about your organisation and your whole ethos. Um, so, you know, all those all those things help. Um, but one thing or, or, or a couple of things probably aren't going to make much of a difference. Um, certainly talking to people um, recently who've decided to leave their careers or, or join different employers, it's been about development and seeing their future. And I think as we've all seen during COVID, like no other time, people have reassessed, is it even the right career for them? So I'm certainly seeing experienced qualified accountants going and doing completely different jobs. So just local to me, um, there's a gentleman many years working in the city as a trust accountant, he's now set up a craft day or tap room which is fabulous, go there most weekends, which is lovely, but not really what we had envisaged, envisaged for the chartered accountant. So how do we tackle that? To be quite honest, I'm not sure we do. He just wanted to move out of the rat race, as he called it, and he wanted to do something that he was passionate about. But if we can make their current roles something that they are passionate about, then they're far less likely to leave. I don't know if that helps, Gareth. <laughs> I think you raised some really interesting points. I mean, that last one, um, some of you on the call, if you've ever studied motivational theory of any sort, you might have come across a pyramid, um, I believe, by a chap called Maslow, if I remember rightly. I used to teach this myself many, many moons ago with all the various needs of an individual from physiological, you know, at the very bottom, you know, the basic needs of not getting eaten by a lion or something, Right the way, and at the very top, if I remember, there was self-actualization. Now, you know, that person you were describing moving into running their own craft brewery, maybe that was their self-actualization. But actually, if, if, the, if their previous employer had somehow managed to harness that need in them and that passion in them, perhaps they wouldn't have left. And in fact, it sounds like they could have been a great asset to the organization if they'd managed to harness that and avoid them leaving I think and actually I mean going back to where you started actually I totally agree about you know it's so much more complex now I remember when I was you know newly qualified you know many many decades ago I was obsessed with what I earned that's all I cared about I wasn't interested in healthcare packages or any of that stuff I was obsessed with earning my age so when I was 25 I wanted to earn 25,000 pounds and I'm 48 now, if anyone's looking to headhunt me and you want a, an idea of where you, need to, where you need to pitch it. But um, yeah, absolutely. But actually, what, you know, the thing that, that struck me most about what you said is that thing around communication. You know, the worst thing you can have is somebody leave because they didn't know how important they were to you or they didn't know how valued they were. And actually, if I can come back to you, Fiona, do you, do you think that this last 18 months of virtual working and the likely hybrid working we're going to see going forward... Does that make that communication harder, do you think? I don't think it has to. I think as managers, we all need to keep in touch with our, our, our teams, whether we're sat across an office with them or virtually via Zoom or Teams or whatever we use. I think certainly what I've seen is some teams communicate more now while we've been working virtually than they used to in the office. Um, you know, putting in regular weekly catch ups or, you know, like our team, we have a weekly call every Friday morning and half of us at least every week go for a walk while we're taking that call. And we well, we did do that Well, we did have the meetings before COVID, but it was a bit more structured, whereas now it's a bit more just feels a bit more relaxed and understanding a bit more about individual people. I can see Fiona in my team is, is nodding her head, so she obviously likes that as well. So I don't think remote or, vert or hybrid working means communication is harder. I think you just communicate in different ways. But communication, I agree, is absolutely key. Yeah, and what, what I found, and it, you know, I've heard the phrase micro praises a lot in the last 18 months. The thing that you would naturally do in an office saying, oh, yeah, well done, you know, good report, you know, nice bit of work that you 
it's harder to do when you're not physically in the same place. You're, it's, you, have, you have to make the informal formal is the way I think about it. So, you know, if I'm chatting to one of my colleagues, if I'm chatting to my colleague Crystal or Amy or Ollie, and they mention another member of staff who's done a great job, I, I take a note of that and I make an effort to contact them and say, oh, well done. I heard you did a great whatever, because I just don't get the chance to do it, passing them in the corridor in, in the office or something. Um, Brilliant. No, thanks, Fiona. Some excellent points to kick us off with. I wonder if I can now turn to um, perhaps Andrew from the AAT. I know you've got a few thoughts for us as well. Thank you, Gareth. Um, good morning, everybody. Nice and sunny where I am as well, so hopefully it is uh, where you are. Um, I think I'd, I'd have to say I agree absolutely with with Fiona and we'll I'll come on to some specifics in a minute but I think a lot of where I'm going to come from comes from some little bits of research that we've been doing with employees with our members and with prospective employees our students um, and it's no surprise having seen the poll that uh, recruiting experienced staff is an issue because that's the thing that came out most with our members I'm nervous why do I want to move um, I'm all right where I am, but this is enough uncertain. Uh, somebody has got to really deliver me an offer to, uh, to get me. But when it comes to that offer, I absolutely agree with Fiona. It's not just about money anymore. Um, oh, that it was as simple as offering Gareth, uh, what, did he, what did he say, 62,000 to match his age. Um, it, it, okay. it, well, you gave me the floor. It's, it's more about being recognised and rewarded, but being rewarded in a different way. It's more fundamental than just the, the financial package. And I think what's coming out loud and clear to us is employers are all different, clearly. Um, but so are employees. And they all want different things. So again, rather like Fiona, I can't offer you a magic solution. I don't think there is one. Um, just while I remember, there's, there's also something which um, has, has come up that Gareth asked a question about communication. Communication is as fundamental now, as important now as it ever has been, and it's better more so. Um, and one thing that we've started to do, I like Fiona's going for a walk during her meetings. Um, we might give that a go. Um, but one of the things that we've, we've, we've always done is on the start of our team meetings, we celebrate success. And it's back down to that micro level that Gareth was talking about. It, 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 we're not standing up and saying, you know, we've delivered another million pounds. That's not where we're coming from at all. We're coming from, well, what have you as an individual? What's, what's, what's been successful for you? And I'm about to introduce, I haven't yet, um, but I've got to stand up this morning with the division. So maybe I will this morning, celebrating failure as well. Um, now, there's a thing, there's an important thing there. Before you do that, you've got to make sure that everybody trusts the environment that they're in and it's a safe environment. So I'm quite happy to go first and celebrate a failure of my own. But I, th I think it's really important that we look at this from, from the employee's angle. So I've got a couple of areas to pick up on, I think. Mission and, and values and vision, all those, all those sort of key words, particularly with younger staff particularly with younger staff and particularly in responsible business and sustainability. It's no longer enough to just have a plan. Uh, people see through that very quickly. What are we actually doing? And importantly, what contribution do I make at an individual level as an, as an employee? What role am I playing? And we're seeing a lot of that in recruitment as well, particularly with, with the younger students who are perhaps more at the school leaver end. Yeah, that's all good words, but what, what do you really do and what role can I potentially play in all of that? So I think there's a, there's a, there's a communication issue there that says employers have got to be really strong. And if they can be strong in their recruitment process, then I think that potential member of staff can get hold of something and can actually say, yeah, I can see what you do and I can see the value that I can add to it. Perhaps an area that's a bit more tangible that, that particularly has come out from, from research with our members, that the one thing that this pandemic has forced us all to do is to think about ourselves. Um, I like the idea of uh, going, and going down the craft brewery route, um, but also to think about professional 
development if i'm going to stay in accountancy or in marketing in my sense in my case what does what does the future hold what do i what can i do to develop it's certainly a strengthening trend um and it it also appears to be being represented more directly again in recruitment and in actual job offers um Maybe it's easier for us to see at AAT because we have very distinct levels of our qualifications and a very clear progression pathway should people want to take it, which could take them into chartered. So we're seeing employers using that to their to their strength and saying, well, you are already qualified. We're looking for somebody qualified at AAT at level three. Here's the pathway to get you through level four and into the next uh, the next stage of your career. And we're seeing that appearing in job offers, not just being discussed in an interview. We're actually seeing it appear very, very strongly in, in a job offer. Now, I don't want to get Gareth going on apprenticeships, but this is where apprenticeships are really scoring for us uh, at AAT and, and our, um, our members and our um, students, um, because it's all linked back very directly to professional development. Um, and, and employees are increasingly seeing that as offering real value. The the real curveball in all of this, I think, is also flexible working. The last point I'm, I'm going to make. Again, the pandemic's forced most of us down this path. But what about the future? This seems to be something that's holding our members back from jumping into another role. The work-life balance has shifted. Um, and from the employee's perspective, a lot of them have got used to it now. And they're rather enjoying it. They're rather enjoying their 90 second commute to work. But what does the future look like? Um, most of our members seem to want to retain and develop this work life balance in the future. They still want to work hard. They still want to make a valuable contribution, but perhaps more on their terms. Um, and it's interesting. Uh, one of my neighbors, in fact, has um, his, his employer have just announced they're going back to the office four days a week. He's leaving because he doesn't want to work back in the office four days a week. Now, everybody's different. A more office environment might suit more people. But I think that trend is shifted. It's gone. Um, and, and I think there's going to be need to be more flexibility around flexible working. Because if there isn't, the employee is going to think, well, that doesn't suit me. I've got rather used to working from home. I still work hard, still make a valuable contribution. But do I really want to commute into London four or five days a week? I'm not sure I do. So it's now more on the employee's terms, I think, um, than than the employer. It's not a it's not a purely a, a buyer's market anymore. I, I, I love that idea. Of, I love that idea of flexible, flexible working. Yeah, um, flexibility around flexibility. <laughs> a great way to think of it, Andrew. Because as you say, you know, we've tried to come up with a flexible working policy, but actually, can you really have a policy when? individuals are in very different no. situations absolutely so i love your point actually because we spent a lot of time at the beginning of this year revising our corporate mission and core values uh, we really useful exercise got lots of input from our teams actually the bit that we haven't really done which you, you raised is that idea of how do you then link each individual's contribution to that yeah mission and core values i think that's a really valid point but thank you and, and actually the point you make i mean i see this in apprenticeships now you know with apprenticeships you do give the learners such clear pathways for their qualification journey from school leaver up to potentially fully level seven qualified accountant sometimes over up to six years you give a very clear pathway with milestones and actually they qualify and perhaps that disappears actually do we need to have a much clearer post-qualification pathway brilliant thank you andrew um actually can i now call on clive from the acca interested in your thoughts clive okay um i'll try and pick up something different from, from the points andrew and fiona made because i think the ditto from all of the above um i think we are seeing different pathways and very much unique pathways developing for each individual and actually the standard tools of retention that we've used historically are going to get blown away because your view, Gareth, Andrew's view, anybody's view is different. And, and those motivational points Andrew talked about, how that relates to how I want to work 
and how I work flexibly is very different from the perspective that we had 18, 24 months ago. Um, and I don't think, as, as I've said on these sessions before, I don't think we're at the end of that journey working out what it is. I think that will continue to evolve. We have to face up to a number of new realities as well, I think. Um, firstly, yes, we've got an aging workforce, whether we like it or not in this country, the workforce is aging. So the judicial paradigms that we've had that play into this whole retention thing are simply gonna continue to move forwards. Um, and we've got to be careful how we think about that from a practical point of view. Um, the other spectre I think we've got to get used to, although we've talked about money not being a motivator, the reality I think is we're heading into a period of constraint and inflation and that balance may well shift. Now, I'm not saying that balance is the same balance we had before. I think we will find more individual packages. It's about working out what your own unique hygiene factor is. So it's about building a flexible model for everybody that allows them to develop, that allows and promotes their own development. And we know there are crucial skill shortages now in the in practice and in the profession that differ from where they were 18 months ago around data analytics, business partnering, interpretation, that's going to continue as well. So it's encouraging people to see where the future is, providing them with those journeys, but also safeguarding other pieces like some of those other hygiene factors. And there's a risk if we go into inflation that we start cutting those and that's not going to work with flexible working. Add to that, I think Fiona made an excellent point about culture and leadership. And I think we will find in organizations that the paradigm of leadership and organizational structures, and this is something Chris Argent and I are working on in our report at the moment, that whole paradigm is starting to be blown away as well. So we're starting to see far more organic structures, which again gives you different retention challenges. So like everybody else, I don't have answers. I have a load of comments and a, a few pointers for people to think about, but it is down to what you and I want as individuals because you're, an empl you're employing an individual. But skill growth, absolutely fundamental. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we, we've heard a bit now around almost tailoring to individuals. Mm. And actually, I think you raised a, a point there, Clive, around actually giving the individual the autonomy to almost guide and tailor their own pathway and their own development. I think that in itself would be, you know, highly appealing to, to a lot of people. Um, you know, you mentioned, actually, you, you mentioned Chris Argent in your, your uh, chat there, and actually we're going to be hearing from Chris later on. He's on the call with us. Um, so thank you very much, Clive. Much appreciated. So, and, you know, Fiona and Andrew, Clive, thank you very much for kicking us off this morning. I did see a question in the chat box, actually, from Tony Hunter. Hi, Tony. Morning. Good, good of you to join us. Uh, do you agree that apprentices need their trainers, mentors to be in the office with them? You know, clients can be serviced mostly remotely, but for those still developing their career, is this feasible? Be interested in other people's views on that. I must admit, I think that would be difficult. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of training of young adults is more around the osmosis they absorb by being in the same environment as somebody else, even if they're not directly talking to them, listening to the way they interact with other people, listening to the way they might be on the call with a client. You know, even sitting in a potentially in a meeting. So. Um, and in fact, I think we've got Ruth from Safri on the call as well, actually. Ruth used a really good expression a few months ago with me, which because she was talking about, if I remember rightly, Ruth, filling from the bottom in the office. I don't um, remember that, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it was well, you. We're still, we're still doing it, yeah. Is that what um, I said? That, that it was about, you know, making sure the trainees were the ones who were prioritised for being in the office, but, but also with their kind of direct mentors, line managers, so they could have that quality time. I, I was talking to a law partner recently, actually, who was even talking about the value of taking a junior to a meeting. And he said the value is in the car journey, sitting in the car with them, chatting before the meeting about what they were going to do and how they were going to structure the meeting, and then chatting on the way back to the office about, well, how did that go? What could we have done differently? Was there anything that could be? And he said that he's really missing the car journey, uh, if nothing else. I mean, I know I miss Sarah Cox and uh, Zoe Ball on beat on Radio 2 because I'm that age demographic now. But <laughs> I hadn't even thought about that, you know, the opportunity to just spend time with a colleague talking quite informally. Uh, so fantastic. Excellent first half an hour. So we've heard there from 
um, the, the, some of the awarding bodies that we work with uh, on the accountancy side. I thought it would be useful actually to hear from a professional recruitment specialist, actually, given the nature of the conversation we're having. So I've actually asked David Cully, somebody I've known for many, many years uh, from Pure Resourcing Solutions to join us this morning. So thank you for coming along, David. And actually, before you even launch into your ideas on this, I want to put a particular question to you, David, because we're talking about retention and attraction, which could be said in one breath. Um, do you think that the same strategies apply to retaining somebody you've already got who you've trained up to being qualified as you would apply to attracting somebody else at that same level to join your organization or do you think it's quite differently approached um, that's a really good question i think <clears throat> i think there's a definite correlation i think if you see attraction as a as, as an employer making a promise and retention is about delivering on that promise is probably how i would link the two points together um because most of, I guess, if you consider the reasons why people would, would look to change their employer, it's uh, typically um, lack of progression would be the obvious number one factor. Um, second point would be a culture piece. And I think culture, certainly if I think about the Cambridge landscape, culture is really easy to start off with. When businesses are relatively new, you can sit down and you can have some crazy, wacky, gin fueled sessions to define what your culture is going to look like. But the reality is, as you start to scale, it becomes more difficult to hold on to that culture. Uh, and I think employees have a really important part to play in that in terms of making the culture theirs, not, not being imparted on telling them what the culture is. Um, and then the third thing would be pay and security. And I'd, I'd stress security more than pay, actually. Um, and if I think about the last 18 months, crikey, it's been a, a really interesting experience and as an observer, stressful, I can see more gray hair now than I had 18 months ago, but the reality of it is, I think there's a, a point about retention now is we actually, as employers, we have an opportunity to harness um, what I've seen as an experience as an employee over this last 18 months. Um, and again, it links back to those three drivers as why people leave jobs. Lack of progression. Well, there's a lot of businesses that have had to just slightly ease off on the on the accelerator pedal just to look, see what happens. And so there should be huge opportunities for your business to get back on track and start to look at the business plan, dust it off or indeed rewrite it. Um, and if you've got people that are able to influence that, then they should do. I think there's this sort of I remember having somebody talk to me about the kind of the pyramid structure of, a, of an organization where your, your leader is at the top and everybody else filters into a wide, wider volume at the base. And he talked about turning that on its head. Uh, and I think he was referring to a Marks and Spencer's experience he had where actually they decided that it's the people that serve the customers that know what the customers want because they hear that and they see it and they experience it. And so the leader sets the strategy, you know, we want to, we want to, this is where we're going. But actually the how question should be something that your people will contribute and actually probably end up defining. So, um, so there's, there's an opportunity right now, if we are at a point where we're feeling confident about growing our businesses and getting back on track with what we had intended to do two years ago. And I guess the, 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 the conflict there is if you don't harness that opportunity with your people, then those people have also paused their careers for two years potentially. So they may be getting a little bit, um, uh, sensitive to the fact that they possibly have, you know, if they've got ambitions to get to the next level, two years has been a pregnant pause that they hadn't anticipated. So there's an acceleration that they're looking to, to achieve in, in, the next, uh, in the next year or so. I think the culture piece is an important piece you mentioned as well, because culture will change. I think um, flexi working has been talked about here. You're absolutely, well, you're not right, but in, you, you agree with what I would say is that you cannot enforce flexi working. That's, that's just a complete kind of, um, it just doesn't make sense, does it? It's hypocritical to say I'm enforcing flexibility, but the reality is I am hearing businesses that are saying we're going to do a two, three. Okay. How has that been? How have you realized that? What's, what's, what's driven that decision? If it's come from straw polls and sort of poll surveys of people, fantastic. But what I've said to somebody, I had a chief executive of a fairly small business last week, I was meeting for coffee and um, he really recognises that his more junior sort of apprentice level staff are suffering as a consequence of not being in the office. And we all know the practicalities of, you know, working on the end of your bed type stuff at that age group. But this was more about the water cooler conversations, the, 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 the osmosis learning that you get from sitting amongst people that have got more experience. 
Um, so he is, he is doing an enforced trial in a sense, that just to see, you know, I'm not saying this is going to stick, but let's just try two days in the office, everybody in, so long as we stick to the COVID guidelines, clearly. Um, but let's just see what the experience is. Let's just see whether this is beneficial. If, you, if you're more productive, fantastic. If you're less productive, let's move it to a different place. Um, so I think that that needs to be a trial and error thing. I don't think we can enforce anything right now. So anyone who's spending time writing policies, I would, I would advise there's better ways of spending your time. Um, and then the, the, the sort of the pay and security, there's, there's a significant uh, ratchet up in terms of people's profiles around risk and, and, and averting risk. So would you be looking to change jobs now, um, putting yourself as the new person in a new business and potentially the first person that leaves that business if things don't go so well? No, not really. So you've got an opportunity as an employer of, of retaining those people. I'm not saying leverage off that kind of that, that vulnerability, but you know, I think the, 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 we are not finding it easy to, to attract candidates to market. Um, it's, it's not the way it is. The, the demand is significantly outstripping um, supply right now. So I think if you can just ensure that people feel like they're being looked after. And the other point on, on what I've seen over the last 18 months um, is actually, a, I guess it's a cultural um, reference point, but you can really tell the employers who have looked after their people and those that haven't. And the difference in terms of loyalty that we're seeing now as a consequence of that, people are saying, I'd love to change jobs. I do feel like I'm a little stagnant, but you know what? My, my boss has been so fantastic. That they've, they've got to know their people better because you're having more personal kind of chats, conversations. It's not in an office environment. You know, you can hear the doorbell go, the dog bark, the child screaming. It makes people kind of realize that there's a life outside of work. So I think um, there should be a, a greater sense of loyalty if you've been getting it right over the last over the last 18 months to two years. Um, did you want me to talk a bit about attraction methods, Gareth? Is that helpful? Yeah, yeah, please do. I think it'd be useful to hear your thoughts, David. Yeah, okay, fine. Well, I mean, I would argue that the majority of people that we hire into new jobs are not the people that are sitting there shopping for a new job. They're people that are, they kind of trust, I guess they trust us to, to talk to them about the right opportunity. So everybody, and I'm sure if we did a straw poll around the room today, how many of you have found your current job because you actively, you know, were looking through the classifieds pages or, or searching on various jobs portals most often it's not it's it's coincidental it's you know it's word of mouth it's recommendation it's referrals and so so i think every employer needs to recognize you as well as an employer you are a brand um and the more people get to know you the more they'll be intrigued and curious about who you are and what you do and probably the, the, the good example i would see because it's close to where i live uh, cambridge medical robotics business that's going absolutely bananas at the moment um, they give all of their staff a superbly smart high-vis cycling jacket with CMR invaders on the back. And I see them everywhere. I see them everywhere. And I kind of, you know, if for no other reason than to get a free jacket, I want to work with that business. Um, Bango is another one. Bango on their job description and their list of benefits. One is you get a free hoodie. Um, and it's just it's just free subliminal advertising. So um, there's that. There's the social media talking about what you're doing. I think the current generation are less interested in what the job is, actually. They're more interested in what the purpose of that organization is. So that's where your social media content can come in. It's not talking about we're looking to hire. It's saying we are doing this. We're making a difference to the lives of people by doing this. Um, so I think that that's something that resonates strongly with people. So actually, by the time somebody approaches them or you approach them or you advertise for a role, they already know enough about you to be, in, to be inquisitive to, to find out more. Um, in terms of, yeah, kind of, I guess, once you've got that audience, it's, 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 it's standing out for the crowd as well. And I, I would cite, I don't know if Paul House on this call, I don't think he is, but, um, I remember he, he works for a, a technology business, Get Busy, and, and they were looking for their first financial controller. And I remember reading, I thought, this, this, this has been posted in the wrong place. This is an accountant, qualified accountant's jobs portal. And I'm seeing somebody looking for a rock star, but he, he did this amazingly different advert that's saying we we are looking to hire a rock star and it looked like a kind of pop idol kind of um uh, picture and stuff and and the words that they used were high energy dynamic kind of stuff and didn't even mention the content of the job it didn't need to because if you're a financial controller or you aspire to be a financial controller you're pretty pretty certain 80 percent of the job you know what it's going to be so why do we still insist on listing you will have 
you know, this qualification, you'll have experience of this, 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 and this. You don't, you kind of, that, that goes without saying. What you need to be doing is presenting the opportunity because, again, you're hooking into the buying signals of that individual. What do they want from you? So, you know, we are looking to scale. We're looking to grow. We're looking to influence. We're looking, those are the bits and pieces. And also, uh, I think to Andrew's point, what role is this person going to have in achieving that, that kind of mission statement for the organisation? So I think that's a bit, just standing out from the crowd is an important piece. Um, I think I've probably referenced this already, but selling the company, not the job. I think that's the critical point. point. Um, and then through the recruitment process, it, we've moved away from, you know, why should we hire you to uh, why, sh you know, why would you want to work with us? There's, there's that balance. And we not, I'm not saying slave becomes master, master becomes slave, but we need to get to partnership level. You need to be talking in language, which is mature um, and, and attractive and welcoming. And the recruitment process needs to be as slick as possible because I know everybody's busy and recruitment is one of a number of things on your to-do list. But if that candidate has an interview and then three weeks later hasn't heard back whether they've had a successful process or experience, you probably lost them anyway, either to another job or because they've lost interest and you're not, they're not feeling special enough. So I think if you're going to go for a recruitment, you really need to make sure that you're keeping those touch points regular. Um, in terms of actually the interview, I think lose the word interview straight away. I don't think people should be going for job interviews anymore. They should be going for discussions to talk about a prospective opportunity. Um, questions around hypotheses. Give an example of when you have. They're, they're, they're old news and they're not. It's an assessment. It's fine if you want to join the SAS or somewhere. But if you're looking about becoming the next HR manager or finance controller, you need to talk about that. This is where we are. We have a plan to change our system we have a, a culture program that we're looking to put in tell me about the experience you've had of doing something similar it's a much more conversational level um discussion and it gets the best out of the candidate so they're not having to kind of use that what's that star situation task that's kind of it's it's old news and so so that would be a, a suggestion and then if you're at the point hopefully where you're looking to offer somebody a, a position don't put pressure on them too much give them the time to consider it talk to their let them talk to their family. The best example, again, I'll cite them as an organization, Broadback, uh, Broadcom, sorry. We recruited their CFO, so top level position. That hirer was aware that they had another job offer somewhere else. And rather than starting to increase their salary or starting to put pressure on, you know, we want to get the first, get first over the line, they actually posted, and this is probably, whether it would stick, some people might cringe on this, they posted the individual a pillow with a note on it saying, have a good night's sleep, don't worry about it, let us know your decision when you're ready and yeah it, it kind of worked um i'm not kind of uh, i'm not a representative of benson's for beds trying to plug pillow sales here but but just little things like that you know just little notes little and then if you are lucky enough to to, to, to hire that person you're going to be there's a notice period which is a critical moment we're having more buybacks as we call them you know kind of turn downs and decisions to actually stay put because because the employer has got three months to really convince that person they've made a wrong decision so you need to be keeping them warm, inviting them to some keep in touch days, inviting them to any um, useful meetings, inviting them to any socials, posting them some stuff, you know, all those bits and pieces are, are things that will enable you to, to kind of um, get that level of emotional commitment from the individual. Which yeah, I, I hear a lot about that period between making an offer and them starting with you as being increasingly important because often it will fall between two departments within your business. Yeah. You'll have, you know, the recruitment team who do the offer and then there's the kind of onboarding induction team that do the next bit. And sometimes there's just nothing going on in between. And, you know, we try and make a big effort to invite people along to social events, for instance, before they even join us just to you know show the culture. Some some great points there, David. Thank you. I, I did get rejected by the SAS, but, you know, their loss, I think. <laughs> Um, but I think the point you make about the the inverted pyramid, I've been thinking about that a lot recently, actually, you know, rather than me at the top of the pyramid, everyone reporting to me, I now see I'm at the bottom. I support my directors above me. They support the managers above them. The managers support the staff above them who then look after the customers and the clients. And so I, I think that's a really good way of thinking about it. And, and what you say about security um, you know, I was in a discussion, actually, Frances Hall, who we're going to be hearing from a, a little bit later. I was in a discussion with her um, as part of the charter group. And there's a lot of talk there around 
you know, things like pension contributions being increasingly important, health care, dental care was mentioned as a specific point. Um, you know, even for relatively young people who we may assume aren't interested in their pensions, but actually that security in the longer term becoming more important. Great stuff. Thank you very much, David. Really appreciate your, your contribution this morning. Um, OK, so we, we've heard from a, a sort of professional recruitment specialist there, David. We're now going to hear uh, from some uh, sort of HR specialists and HR experts. And although uh, I think was it Andrew or Clive who earlier said that they weren't going to bring the magic, I am now expecting to get some magic because I've seen her talk a little bit before. If I can now ask CJ to, to give us her thoughts. Thank you. So I've made a massive note on my pad that just says bring the magic. So you were right. Um, and those of you that have seen me kind of do this kind of thing before, what I try and do is always talk to you a little bit about some of the things that we see that clients are doing and some tips that you can actually think about. Could that work in my context? So I don't have all the answers, but I do have 10 answers that might kind of work in your context. So I'm going to give it a whirl. Um, my first one is some really great stuff that happens in organisations at the moment around you asked, we listened, because actually in as much as kind of old school kind of employee engagement surveys are a bit dead, if you ask me, so are doing surveys and then ignoring anything that anyone says in a survey until next year we ask for training and a pay rise all over again and that doesn't happen all over again. So it's around if you're asking for your people's opinion, make sure you go back to them and tell them that you listened about your, their opinion. And secondly, everybody knows that you can't just unilaterally give loads of pay rises. We're not stupid folk in, in businesses. And so kind of being honest about that, but saying here's some stuff we can do is a really authentic way of going about that. The other thing that I think is really helpful is entering things like um, employee, uh, employer awards and not enter to win, but enter to learn. I was really lucky in as much as that I was involved in some judging for best employers in our region. And actually some of the companies that put forward for the award said, we are in this to learn because we get what we need from the feedback around what we need to do in the future. And I think what an extraordinary way to grow your employee proposition as an organization. So you asked, we listened and enter awards to learn is number one, I would say. Uh, my number two is around givers gain. So this is the, the notion of reciprocity. You know, as David was talking about, the power dynamics in our worlds are really different now and partnership is really important. But if we treat our employees and the acquisition and retention of our employees like we treat customer acquisition and retention, we might go about things a really different way. Now, in all of our organizations, someone somewhere is acquiring your customers and really thinking quite hard about retaining them. So why not go and ask those people what their thoughts are on uh, uh, attracting and retaining your employees? Because it's the same kind of psychology that's used and you've already got that superpower in your organisation somewhere. So go hunt it out and have a great conversation. The third one I would say is about influence and I don't know if anyone has done any kind of thinking around network analysis and influences an organization but this is one thing that gets me really excited in that there are hidden influences that sit in your organizations that you don't even know about and influencers aren't the people with the big job titles ordinarily they're people who um, kind of have presence in an organization they tend to be the people that someone will go to for advice or where do I turn in when I'm in trouble? And we did a wonderful piece of work where we went into an organization that wanted to turn around their profits. They said culture was the problem. And we asked five questions. It was, who do you turn to for advice? Who makes you laugh? Who's got the gossip around here? Where would you go if you were in trouble? And it was five questions around very personal relationships. We found influence in that organization and we used those people to level up what was happening in terms of culture and what a massive difference that made, 
rather than having the group of MDs or directors in a, in a room deciding what everybody needed to make them feel better at work. So find your influence somehow and leverage their superpowers. Um, so my kind of fourth one, and this is you know, a, a, an obvious point, um, but creating paths for people's growth is a huge, huge part of retaining people. And people particularly now will stay because they can visualize a future that you're helping create for them. Um, and, and things have got tough at the moment um, in terms of retaining people and developing people. But actually, it feels tough because it's different. I'm not one of these people that buys that it actually is tough. It's just we're having to use our brain cells a bit. We can't do lots of best practice at the moment because there isn't any. So we are the creators of best practice that quite excitingly people in the future will be talking about. So let's embrace it as we're the ones that are going to create it with other people who are going to come afterwards to use our best practice. So create those paths for growth and, and let's make this the generation that creates some really different thinking about the people stuff. Um, my next one is be smart about well-being. So we have moved a long way, I'm hoping, from a smoothie bike and some salad in the office being the way to promote well-being. A fruit basket does not do it for me, I'm afraid, and it's not many people will feel actually you've really embraced well-being because of that kind of thing. Well-being isn't also, we've got to be quite careful, well-being isn't always about somebody being able to switch off from work and go and have a bubble bath or have a day to themselves. Sometimes we need to be tougher in our and more logical in our thinking about well-being. Somebody who has an opportunity to stretch themselves and learn something new, that's about their well-being because you're contributing to their future. Somebody that is put in a situation where they're slightly uncomfortable, but they're surrounded by psychological safety, but you're giving them the opportunity to grow. That's about well-being. I think we need to come away from the notion that well-being is all kind of the fluffy stuff. It's about what are you deliberately thinking about somebody's future and how that's being shaped? Um, and, and when I come back to the deliberate thing, my, my next one is around be deliberate about fun. So in all of my interactions with organisations at the moment, they're saying the thing that isn't happening at the moment is we're not having fun. And actually, people tend to leave organisations because there's a lack of progress. They hate their manager, um, but they stay because their friends work there. And how do you give people the opportunity to have friends at work? You help them make memories together, because if they're talking in a year's time about, do you remember that crazy occasion when that happened and they can all have a laugh? Those are the things that will, they will really think about when they're thinking, do I want to move on from here? It's a bit tough now, but actually, can I imagine never working with these people again? And I think we've all been in jobs where that is how you feel. The, the job is tough, but I love who I work with. And that makes a, it's such a big part of who we are as individuals. So I'm going to talk about kind of superpowers next. So this is my probably my favourite one of the 10 I'm going to talk about. Let people use their superpowers. You know, everybody has some stuff they are epic at and everybody, I'm going to try not to swear, everyone has some stuff they are really less epic at. And if we strive for people to get better at the stuff they're rubbish at, they will only ever get to mediocre and that's not a great place to be and you don't thrive. If you go, what are people's superpowers and have we got an organisation where this person can use their superpower? And if you don't know what their superpowers are, find them, because as soon as you home in on that, then they're, they're kind of the ability to thrive and enjoy where they work um, just kind of elevates massively. So let people use their superpowers. My number nine, and this is to kind of Fiona's point when we were um, introducing um, things today, encourage a side hustle. So this is one of the things I think that is shifting and I think in quite an exciting way is historically we've all been quite obsessed that you have one job, you know, and you are loyal only to me and you can't think of anything outside your working world unless it's some hobbies that don't interrupt with what's going on here. 
Nowadays, people want to have a side hustle. The accountant wants to really embrace craft brewery, and I don't blame him because beer is awesome, um, but encourage those side hustles because actually the skills someone will learn by being embedded in a side hustle as well as working for you will be enormous contribution to your organisation. And there'll be skills that you won't even be thinking of as part of your kind of internal career paths. So definitely encourage side hustling. And the more you actively encourage that and are open about it, the more people think this is a cool place to work. So definitely that's one that works well. And my final one, and I'm hoping I've got to 10 because I got quite excited, but number 10 for me is concentrate on the energy in your organisation because that is the thing that we're struggling with at the moment. Even the greatest of great people feel currently a little bit meh. And actually, if you're paying attention to where the energy levels are of your business and your organisation and those around you, then you can really feel like, what can I do to bring this energy level up? And it's not best practice from years ago, it's new practice. So let's just give that a go. Gareth, I'm done with my 10 now. Absolutely fantastic, CJ. 10 minutes, 10 points, uh, hit the bill, perfect. Some really great points there. I love that side hustle one. It made me think of actually one of my former students, who a few of my colleagues will know, uh, who is now CFO of a tech startup. But on the side, she's also one of the country's up and coming retailers of English wine uh, and is in the press constantly. She's uh, constantly in the press about the wine that she sells as well and clearly loving both roles. So fantastic. Thank you so much, CJ. Um, well, can we turn immediately? I'm hoping for some similar uh, practical points from Catherine. Thank you very much, Gareth. And Gareth, I know that I mentioned to you that I'm going to share a couple of slides with you all. Um, yeah, we can see the slides coming up if you want to start them there. I'm hoping you'll be able to hear a video. So let's see if that works. Um, because what everyone has been talking about has been absolutely spot on. I'm typically working with people managers and career professionals to decipher what makes them as an individual want to do things and not want to do things. So are they in sync with each other? And Listening to a few of those tips, I'm struck by this need for people to want to shine as an individual. I've lost count of the number of times in my long career as in recruiting, interviewing, career management, when the person in front of me has said, I'm not your typical accountant. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean Everyone in finance is quiet, analytical, good at maths, maybe risk averse. So why is it that we are framing people by what they do rather than who they are? And as we moving into a post pandemic environment, I'd like for us to look at perhaps the meta picture why are we experiencing what we are? It's not just pandemic, it's the technology revolution, it's automation that's happening, but primarily there's another reason. And that is longevity. Now, this is a very short clip from Linda Grattan and Andrew Scott at the London Business Schools research that I'd like to share with you. We're all going to live a lot longer, some of us up to 100 years and beyond. For the last two centuries, life expectancy has risen by around three years every decade. That adds up to a lot more time. As a result, the three stages of education, work and retirement will no longer exist. What will come in its place? London Business School professors Linda Grattan and Andrew Scott have been thinking through the impact of longevity on the world. Everything will change for people, businesses and governments. 
The key to a successful 100 year life will lie in how we use all the extra time we'll have. One thing we'll have to do is work longer. Retiring at 65 won't be an option unless we have many, many more savings. And the education we received in our teens is unlikely to see us through our career, especially as new technologies and jobs emerge. What's more, no one will be able to maintain the same pace in life. Because a good and productive life needs more than just money, it depends on intangible assets too, like family, friendship and love, good health, new knowledge and skills, and extraordinary experiences. We're likely to try different careers, take breaks, move to new cities, and reinvent ourselves several times over. We will be living a multi-stage life where activity and age become disconnected. How can you get ready for this radical change? Linda and Andrew have a few ideas. Audit your tangible and intangible assets today and start planning for your future. Use your free time to invest in fitness, skills and relationships. Think about the experiences you want to have and plan for them. Experiment. There are no role models to follow, just your passions. Be flexible and open to change. Explore your options. Longevity isn't just about getting older. It's really about being younger for longer. How are you going to put your extra time to good use? So as we can see there, we have these very long lives that we're leading. So no wonder people are wanting side hustles, want to be living now. We don't want to be waiting for that retirement that's unlikely to happen. For some of us because we won't be able to necessarily afford it or maybe it's our choice we don't want to retire off the back of that here are some trends that i've certainly picked up that echo what a lot of you have been saying today the pre-pandemic workplace all in the office potentially 9 to 5 30 low flexibility and when we were recruiting David Cully was saying we were focusing potentially more on the task, skills focused, it was about an interview you were coming for, and through all this lower levels of a trust and autonomy. But now we need to think about reinventing this future workplace. We've all had that a lot of time to think about what we want and what we don't want, what we're going to put up with and what we aren't going to put up with. So remote and hybrid working goes some way to answering that flexibility need for people. But it's this demand for personalization that is the key trend. Focusing now on the person, their passions, their purpose, motivations, attitude. What is it that they want and how can we help them to grow? When we're talking about growing and thinking of potentially a garden, we talk about putting the right plant in the right place for it to flourish. And as people, we're not different in that respect. So practically, a tip for you to take away and potentially use in your organisation is to reframe that employee experience as a journey. Help them navigate their map. Now, this is based somewhat on Dan Pink, who, as we know, those traditional awards of money and even pensions and security and promotions aren't going to cut it anymore. But what are those intrinsic motivations for that particular individual? So if we start with that map and look at mastery, when we've hired someone, we've probably spent quite a lot of time thinking about what are the skills that they're masterful at? But take them into your garden or your environment. They're going to need really good support, development, onboarding to adapt those skills to your organisation. And then secondly, what are the skills that they want to master and become better at? 
And then just like that, you'll have a mutual win-win. If we jump then to purpose, we've talked a lot about having this bigger picture, a greater need to know what we're working towards. It might be that for some people it's doing good in the world. But it's not just that, having a clear vision in your organization. It's what's important to them in their work. So asking them constant questions about what is it that's important to you about this project, about your work, about the colleagues you work with. And then finally, that glue in the middle is trust them, give them autonomy and stress that this is your map. It's different to everybody else's and we're okay with that. How you achieve our shared business goal and your personal goals are very much in your hands, but you're there to support them. Gareth, I'll hand back to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Catherine. Actually, some really great questions there. I think a lot of us can be asking ourselves and asking colleagues. Uh, really useful. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, Francis, I did mention you earlier. I'm wondering if you might have a, a few points to add actually to this discussion because I know it's the sort of conversation you have quite regularly. <laughs> it is. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think it's been really interesting listening to what everyone's been saying and, it, and it's hard to disagree with any of it um, and nor would I want to, but I think there are some additional things that I'm seeing um, when I'm talking to firms in practice and organisations um, in a broader context. But I think one of the things that um, resonated with me was I was having a conversation yesterday with a bunch of managing partners from practice. And they were sort of, we were looking back 15 months and thinking, you know, what were they thinking was going to happen over COVID? And actually it was quite pessimistic. People thought that business was going to go down when furlough was going to finish, there were going to be mass redundancies and all the talk was quite negative. And what's actually happened in a lot of sectors, and I accept not all, and there are some sectors that are seriously struggling, but certainly in the sort of finance and professional world, that's just not been the case. Um, fin comes up. If you look at the numbers from some big four, they've gone, gone much higher. Practice is booming. Um, other sectors as well are doing well. Um, and actually, we are entering a period of skill shortages even more than we had before. We know that there were skill shortages in, in particular areas, but I think that um, that's even greater. And, and those of us who've been around a long while um, sadly, this isn't a cycle that we've not seen before. Um, we see a reduction in the number of, of trainees, and then um, shortly afterwards, there's a massive pull, massive pull to try and get the really good people. I think also the thing I'm seeing, and, and this was the point that, that David was saying as well, is people aren't moving at the moment. Um, but that doesn't mean they won't be soon. So I think you've got a quite a short window to try and build on what you've done well over the um, period of the pandemic to try and retain those people that you want to. And recognise you don't actually want to retain everyone. Um, there's a sense that we've got to retain all staff. We don't. Uh, we want to make sure we know who our good staff, who our stars are and where the place for everyone is. Um, so the main thing that I, I want to say is about not leaving things too late. Um, those of you that, that are accountants qualified, probably if you think back to your career, you know, you started off knowing absolutely nothing. Well, I certainly knew absolutely nothing. I, I hadn't even done accountancy at university. And after about, you know, a couple of years in, all of a sudden you think you know everything. You know, you've been doing the job two years, you've done loads of exams, um, you're starting to think, oh, this works, you know, what next? And you're doing that way earlier than when you qualify. And one of the things that I observe is um, firms and, and organisations that are surprised when people qualify and leave. You know, um, it's too late by then. 
it's after that, particularly I think after your, you know, professional stage of your exams or your, in the, the case of ACA, your um, applied um, skills exams, it's then you need to be having the conversations about career development if you haven't been having them earlier. Um, I, I heard only recently, I was talking to a manager um, at a firm and they'd left one firm and gone to another. They'd handed their notice in to be told, oh, we were going to make you a manager soon. Well, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> you know, it's no good waiting till I have my notice in. And I sit there and I'm so sad because that's something that would have happened 10, 20 years ago and it's still happening. And there's no excuse. Um, it, there really isn't. That sounded a bit school marmish, but I, I really get cross when I hear those things, as I'm sure um, other people do as well. Um, but some things that can work, so, um, and I, I totally agree about the conversation in the car, but if, if you're not having the conversations in the car, you kind of need to manufacture those conversations. And I, I have um, a client who are 12 partner practice, and every month, one of the partners takes out a group of the, the trainees for lunch, only, I mean, not expensive lunch, but just down to the pizza place. And, we're, and they sit and chat. And what they've discovered is that, you know, if you work in one particular, particularly in a, a smaller practice or a, a department within a bigger organisation, um, you know everything about that, but you don't know very much about how other people work and what the opportunities are. So understanding the opportunities that are available in your organisation, accepting that people might not want to work in that job, but might want to move. So just thinking of ways to... Um, mentor people and have those conversations about and I absolutely support the comments I'm not going to repeat them about people's individual aspirations um, the knowing where you fit in um, someone mentioned the, the point about what younger people are looking for and there's been a huge amount of research isn't there about you know uh, what younger people want and I absolutely support the views about they want to know where they fit in and they want to know what the purpose of that organisation is. Um, they're very much keen on looking at what the organisation does. Um, things like sustainability are really important and sharing uh, what is going on within the organisation. So again, with staff that are already there, um, you know, it's about how you share that. It's about how you have share your business plan, your successes, your failures, and helping people to feel part of the organisation as early as you can. Don't wait until um, later when you're starting to think of them as being <coughs> more senior staff. Um, the other, the other thing that's really important to people going in is about the importance of generating and developing their skills. Jobs for life went ages ago, so young people are often looking for a range of development um, to develop their skills, build up their kit bag of skills, and that's not just their technical skills. So it's really important to start with some of the non-technical training early as well. Um, don't just focus on technical and technical skills and the skills that go. And again, apprenticeships are really good at mixing that um, um, in a formal way. And then the last, the last thing is um, have a plan. You know, it, you have business plans. Do you have people plans? Do you know who your talent are? Do you know um, every member of staff um, should appear somewhere in your talent plan? You know, no, not just based on a gut feeling, who's good and who isn't, you do need to put in place some processes to help you support understanding. If you've got a range of people with different aspirations, somehow you've got to keep track of that. And, um, you know, your, your annual appraisal is definitely not the way to do that. So, um, you know, you do need to, to have some sort of process. So those would just be my observations. Um, one of the things that I, I love on the recruitment side is I have a client and they, they, they're in a, a city just outside another bigger city. Um, and they, they literally know every single person that works in their competitors. They know 
who they want to come and work for them. And it's, uh, they haven't got the vacancy yet, but they know that when they need a tax manager or an audit manager, that's the person they're gonna go for. And they start to build those relationships with those individuals through networking, um, you know, promoting their brand, promoting their organization in a really structured way, um, in the same way that they go after new clients. And they have a partner whose job it is to do that. And I just think that's a really, you know, focused approach because they recognize that, that they're not the big players. They aren't necessarily going to be the first port of call that someone thinks of, but they have huge staff retention when they get Brilliant. Thank you, Francis. Some really excellent points there. Um, and actually, I mean, you've raised a couple of points that had already been referenced around, um, you know, having that, that early career conversation about letting people know where they stand so they don't resign when actually you're about to promote them, giving them the clarity, particularly in our world of accountancy, the clarity after they qualify of what their journey might look like, whether it's entirely vertical or horizontal or diagonal within the organisation. I think retention of good team players is just as important as retention of your shining stars that are going to be your future you know, CFOs and managing partners. Uh, and you talked as well about the importance, not just from a retention uh, perspective, but the skills development. And we've seen that as a growing trend so much so that it's a big new strategy of ours is looking at the post-qualification education space to so be able to help our employers with leadership and management training, with, you know, the emerging areas of digital technologies, data analytics. And it's becoming such a big part of of what we do now that we've actually literally in the last few days we've appointed a new director of post-qualification education my colleague crystal haygreen who has actually got a couple two or three people that we work with to develop some of these programs which we're hoping will be able to give a lot more clarity to that post-qualification skills development and progression journey so crystal thanks gareth um some really great conversations there and some really great ideas um Personally, I've been training accountants for over 17 years now. Ouch. Um, and so I've been taking people through to that point where they're qualified. And I wonder how many of those, um, those students who once qualified have stayed with that firm of accountants or with that organisation that they were training with. Um, it was very much sort of the idea that once qualified you then looked for that next step up but that next step up was outside of the organization that you're trained with um and i think that very much fits with the feel that we've heard there from other people um i know that once i qualified as an accountant that was just the start really of my development journey i had a lot to learn i definitely did learn a lot and i i'm definitely by no means a finished article there's still a lot that i do need to continue to develop and learn um, for my future career. Um, as Gareth mentioned there, we are um, really looking at how can we show our, our accountants that becoming qualified, getting your ACCA, ACCA, whichever it might be, getting to that point is not the end of your learning. It's not the end of your development and it's not the end of your opportunities within the organization that you're with. How can we provide the training and support for those learners that will take them through or for our employees that will take them through um, to further their career? So I'm really, really grateful, really lucky to be leading on our development of programs that are about supporting our future finance professionals what they will do once qualified as an accountant and how they will go through those next five, 10 years of their career. And how can we help our employers support their staff to be able to do that? Um, and we're, we're looking at our programs in terms of the digital finance training um, and also leadership and management skills, which have been mentioned a few times um, across these sessions as well. Chris had a bit of a shout out earlier. Um, so I would like to come to Chris. And Chris is um, founder and managing director of Generation CFO. He's specialist in digital finance, training leadership and transformation. Um, Chris, could you sort of sum up for us um, really the importance of training in that digital finance um, area? 
Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I will fly through this. But I think in summary, you know, what a lot of people have talked about so far is is about the culture and the sort of organization and, and the man management side of things. But if we're looking to attract and retain good people, you know, we also need to look at what they do on a day to day basis and try to improve their jobs try to do something different, try to create a learning opportunity and look way past, you know, the qualification. And there's been a bit of chat around, you know, qualification seems to be the end point and the destination for so many people, but it's, it's really not anymore. Um, you know, our focus is around digital technology. It's around, you know, you'll have heard of things like automation, data analytics, BI, app advisory, you know, there's loads of stuff in this space and it all can improve what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And I would say right now there's, you know, we need to construct a new learning path that looks way past the qualification and inspire people to kind of improve their jobs as they go. You know, if we didn't adopt Zoom a year ago, where would we be? All trying to do this on our phones. So there's, there's a, a whole universe and the technology is there for sure. The real gap is in our L&D, possibly HR's understanding of how we align our existing talent to these new skills. And, you know, we're really happy to be working with you guys because we believe that, you know, we can be excellent data analysts, not just sort of Excel jockeys cobbling things together. We can be automating workflows processes saving us time you know we could be sort of leading on tech change within our organizations the cfo's being asked to kind of get their arms around it and transformation so you know there's there's a huge sort of world out there that we need to engage with and i would say at the moment you know the number one priority seems to be around business partnering and being a great business partner but it's not going to suit everybody so let's present this as the alternative pathway way past qualification yeah thanks chris it's um building those skills beyond that qualification and the, there is just such an importance and there's such a buzz around the need for um those digital finance skills cj i'm going to come back to you i loved your um your top 10 earlier and for me a number of those really are the reason I'm with First Intuition is that there's a lot of those within your top 10 that I know certainly as an organisation we do adopt. Um, in terms of that post-qualification space and where that training is needed, what would be your take on that sort of that need in terms of leadership and management skills um, for our finance professionals? Yeah, I mean, this is it's such a nuanced area, isn't it? And it's kind of there is a wealth of of kind of different types of learning and in learning interactions out there that it's no, you know, it's no surprise the government itself have kind of become slightly fixated on lifelong learning as the new way we need to think about it. We're not qualified and done. It's going to be there for, for the long haul for all of us and keeping on developing and leveling up. What, what we see in the interactions and certainly you know from those that have come from a non-people orientated route or if they've kind of got a more technical skill versus kind of a, a leadership people skills is things around influencing so you might know your stuff but can you convince someone else that, that, that they need to know your stuff or that you can help them make better decisions um, kind of leading remote teams, there's huge amounts of emotional intelligence that need to come into play with the way that we're working now. So that how do we influence, how do we lead differently, how do we drive innovation? And it's those types of skills that actually you can't qualify and be done with because those are ever evolving, ever flexing. And so that continuous kind of approach to levelling up is really important. Absolutely. That um, you mentioned there about that need to be able to influence. Um, that leads me nicely into someone else who's joined us today, um, Alexandra from Speaking Ambition, who I'm working with on um, a number of areas of our programme. Um, Alex, you've you, part of what you um, are really 
sort of working towards or where I'm working with you is that need for finance professionals to be able to influence, to be able to communicate well. Um, what is it that, why is it so important in the finance industry that we see that as a, an area that individually we do need to work on and skills that we need? Um, <clears throat> you know, it's a, I think we've almost led so nicely everything that has been chatted about during this, this whole session has been about that we're looking for more and it's not just looking at just the technical skills anymore um, but looking at how we use our whole selves in the role to be effective and this hasn't been as addressed and CJ just uh, mentioned emotional intelligence which is is now being looked at as a core skill in terms of adding into your professional skills and the reason why that's so important is because so many people aren't actually looking at their we, we're talking about well-being and not being fluffy. It isn't fl fluffy because it's a lot to do with how you perform and your performance and your in interaction and engagement with other human beings. And especially, um, as, as Chris was saying, if you're learning these skills in terms of very analytical, data-driven skills, you have to be the one that connects that to the rest of uh, uh, the stakeholders in your organisation. So it's really important to look at how you influence. And, and I always say, regardless of if you are um, more on the scale of of, of reserved or introverted or even um, extroverted, either way you have an influence. It's just about understanding how you can leverage and best understand how it works for you. Um, really love the, the hidden influences, CJ, that you were talking about earlier, absolutely. So it's about understanding the different dynamics and relationships. Um, so I'll give you really quickly, because again, we're of time, so what's happening at the moment is if we don't understand how your personality strengths work, how to build relationships, um, what we're seeing is that people are feeling really disconnected, very isolated, um, and equally really frustrated when trying to get across their point or, um, or even with leadership skills and managing people, which is one of the things we're talking about. So, and the result of that can feel completely overwhelmed so many of the clients I'm working with at the moment they're just feeling that sense of there's no stopping there's it's complete screen time um it's not just it's all work and no play and that can be huge um really impacting on our whole selves which is why it's important to understand how you best operate so I'll give you five points of things to look at um, or create space for in terms of your um, performance and effectiveness skills, especially with those post-qualifieds that are moving, going to be moving along their journey, especially so they can see how they're going to get to that uh, experienced management levels as well. Um, so the first one is self-awareness, which is becoming one of those bit of a buzzword, but if we break it down really simply, it's knowing uh, what your friction points are, it's knowing what your, as we said earlier, superpowers and personality strengths are. So if you are more analytical and reserved, or if you are really direct and results driven, or if you're influential and a people person, it's about using those skills to your best effect and recognizing them in other people as well. Um, the second is relationship building skills. So really digging deeper and not just taking people at face value, really looking at what they're fully communicating to you if they're stressed, if they're overwhelmed, actually going, not taking things as personally maybe and saying, okay, what's happening here? How can we actually uh, efficiently have a conversation that drives it forward towards an action and keeps us all accountable and, we all, and we're all going to be motivated to actually achieve it. Sorry, Alex, um, can I give you 30 seconds? We're 30 nearly seconds. done. 30 seconds? Oh, that's a challenge. Sorry, we're at 10 o'clock no now. Um, okay, the third is values, so you can understand what your needs are and the needs of your people. So we're talking about side hustles. That's absolutely it. It really is crucial for especially decision-making processes. Um, we've talked about making the numbers talk, um, particularly with data analytics skills. You are the translator of that information or, the, or your people are the translator of that information. So it's really important to be able to communicate that effectively. So hopefully, have I done it? Have I done 30 seconds? 
rounded that up. Yay! Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you, Alex. And I'm really excited at the, the opportunity to work with Alex, with CJ, with Chris on these developments of new programmes. Uh, we will be disseminating a lot of information about digital technologies and data analytics that we're going to be doing, leadership and management that we're going to be doing. So watch out for that. There is a webinar actually next week, which I'm actually just going to quickly ask in 30 seconds, my colleague Lucy, our managing director in Yorkshire, to perhaps just mention, because I know you're running it next week, which people might be interested in. I am. Thank you, Gareth. I'll do my best. Um, Andy has just put in the chat box the link for that. So if any of you have attended our previous leadership lunch and learns on resilience or hybrid working. This is the first one after our summer break next Tuesday at 12.30. So following on from all the great comments today, we're going to be looking at leadership and management skills, techniques in terms of making you know, future success of your teams and very much following the retention theme that we've heard a lot about today. And I've got a great panel headed up by uh, Carolyn Connery from the CMI. So it'd be really great to see a lot of you there next week if you can join me. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to it myself, Lucy. Well, what an incredible 90 minutes. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. Such a great array of points there. I hope everyone has found that really useful and found something they can take away. Thanks for our audience for attending. That's been a great uh, turnout. Enjoy the rest of your day and I look forward to seeing you all very soon. Thank you very much.